what it is how's it going everybody today we're going to be talking about dune part two we're going to be talking about all the things talking about the spice and how it's got a flow i know i did that joke last time but i'm doing it again because it's a it's a it's a two-peat it's a it's a it's a it's a redo you know what i'm saying and then we're also going to talk of course about these sand worms talk about uh, uh, uh all the religion going on and 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 possible messiahs being out here white savior complexes all that good stuff and if you want to hear what we have to say sit back Back, relax grab a snack grab a beverage and listen on in to the first ones to die hey everyone welcome to the first ones to die podcast my name is jonathan and we of course are here with jerome and alex how are y'all doing today alex how you doing Oh, I'm fighting to stay awake right now. <laughs> uh, it's it's been a long week for. Or, oh my God, we're recording this Monday, so it hasn't necessarily been a long week. It's been a long uh, day. Just already feels like it. It's been a long weekend. It's been a long weekend. Sure. Uh, but, well, I helped my sister move like a little bit. I mainly just babysat her dogs, uh, because they have no chill whatsoever. But then again, they're like the Samoyed, a husky, and a corgi. I don't think they're they're meant to be chill. Um, and also, I had to take my car in to the shop this morning, too, really bright and early. So I'm, like, exhausted from that. My <laughs> window broke. <laughs> so it's a, f- a funny story, I guess. I was at public storage. I was putting things away. And I was trying to put my window up. And all of a sudden, my window stopped going up. And it kind of made a weird noise. And then it slid down. And it sounded like the whole bottom half shattered or something. Or broke a crack. And then so my window, I was like, all right, I'm just going to put my window down. Maybe I just need a fixer or something. The moment I like pushed the down button, it went down. Like hard. It it was just gone. Yeah, I couldn't get back up. So like (laughs) the window was just gone. Just gone. How does that even happen? Yeah. I don't know. Everybody keeps asking, like, what what did you do? I didn't do anything. (laughs) I just. I was just trying to put my window up. It was cold. So I've been driving around without a window. <laughs> For how like, long? Oh, just a couple of days. Just a couple of okay. days. But it's also been horribly rainy those couple of days. Uh, it's been it's been fun. Is the inside around. of your car okay? The interior? Interior is fine. A little wet, but it's fine. But now it's at the shop. Hopefully they'll fix it. But they're not going to get the part to like Wednesday. Because as I mentioned, oop, as I mentioned, I've had a Volkswagen Beetle. Which is not only a specialty car, it is a foreign car and a discontinued car. Mm. I think I might just need a new car at this point in my life. Something very generic and like that they I can would... get the piece the day before. <laughs> I want the strength and resiliency of your car because your car is a your it's car lasted. Is hanging, it has lasted, <laughs> yeah. You've gotten your money worth. Like I said, I'm going out or it's going out. We'll see. <laughs> but other than that, I mean I'm just a little bit tired, so I'm going to be a little bit droopy. But I mean, I still do got a lot to say about this movie. But, <laughs> but yeah. how, how's your how's your week been, Jerome? It's been good. I've been chilling. Uh, it's been a big week. I've got a lot done. Um, firstly, I've watched the Avatar series mini review coming for that soon. Um, quick thoughts. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> however, however caveat a lot of the people that are out here trying to be like this show's trash this show's terrible it's like listen i think a lot of like i've i've watched the reviews i've listened to what they have to say and while a few of them do have some strong points about the writing well, the writing is not amazing it's it's very serviceable it's it's uh it's okay i i will say most of the issue those people have is they immediately are wanting it to be the cartoon I'm telling you now, for those of you who are interested in seeing it or interested in wanting to watch it, it's not the cartoon and it never was going to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, that's a high bar that only the cartoon can match. Hell, even Legend of Korra, people still like, people who love Avatar The Last Airbender still say, as much as they like Korra, it's not Avatar The Last Airbender. So not even the sequel to the cartoon could be the cartoon. Like, it's just. It, you're ne- you're never gonna match it. It's a really good, well told story, and it's really solid. And uh, I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you're going into the show expecting it to be nearly as good. That being said, though, if you accept it as its own thing, 
look at, you know, it kind of just go into it with an open mind. It's not amazing, but there are some fun things they do with it. And it, it was cool to see at the Avatar world in a live action setting. Uh, especially because we got a live action movie and it was trash. So <laughs> I was, I'm was i glad that there is a live action version of Avatar that looks somewhat decent, has some good character moments. Um, I just know and- from TikTok, people are talking about, I, I forgive me because I haven't watched, I never grew up on Avatar. But you never watched it? Not really. It would come on and I would watch like a couple minutes of it and I'd be like, mm, I'm kind of bored. Jonathan, That's I insane. feel like you would love Avatar. Like, oh, really? The, yeah, I do. I think if you could get into it, like if you could get past like the first two episodes, because the first two episodes is like a two-parter. Like it's the first episode, it's like episode kind of blend together. You're but talking if, about the Netflix version. No, the the regular version, the cartoon. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the cartoon's great. It's, it's, a great. it's a great cartoon, but I will say it is one of those things where the beginning is the tester for everybody because it begins very much like a kid's cartoon. <laughs> And then later on, it becomes like the most like dramatic thing you've ever seen on television. <laughs> what I was gonna say was uh, I'm I'm not sure what her name is, um, but she's the older lady, the grandma maybe I don't know. Uh, but everyone online was talking about her veneers or and or dentures and how they're very noticeable. <laughs> Uh, I haven't I've, seen that. What I haven't character? seen that either, <laughs> but I believe it. You know, TikTok gets weird about certain things. They do. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's like, so yeah, Avatar, look out, be on the lookout for the full mini review to hit the YouTube channel uh, where you can see, hear my full thoughts on the show. Um, also, uh, I'm loving the world's greatest reality TV show on the planet right now, aka the 2024 elections, election season, because good it God, <laughs> it is the most entertaining thing. Watching the Republican Party become like that meme of the dog who's sitting in like an, uh, an office building that's on fire, and they're just like, this is fine. <laughs> because like essentially being responsible for the like take in i think it's alabama or whatever the taking down of like ivf <laughs> yeah like uh like fertilization like intravenous um excuse me if i mispronounce it but intravenous uh fertilization and then be like trying to walk that shit back and be like no nah, no nah, see we didn't come on y'all come on help me out come on y'all say something y'all like i've done a lot of talking y'all should say something so, to help me out <laughs> like trying to walk that shit back because they fucked up they fucked up and now they're realizing how many use that stuff and now it's just like y'all keep making policies trying to take down like birth control and uh uh you know abortions and everything else this is you reap what you sow because now you done pissed off your own fan base your own party meanwhile the democratic side looks like a bunch of puppy dogs that can't get shit done (laughs) everybody's fucking up out here a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> it's just, it's just been the, it's just been the goddamn clown show. Dumpster Just fire. like it was last year, last time. And the year before that, yeah. It's and the year not before that. <laughs> getting better. Mm-hmm. I don't know who to vote for. I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to write my own name in. Might as well be. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm just as good a candidate at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been fun and uh but you know what i i needed some relaxation and some time for myself so i finally bought hell divers 2 and i've been having a blast playing hell divers 2 and just enjoying fighting for democracy and spreading liberation amongst the galaxy <laughs> we love and if that. you are a player of hell divers 2 hit me up i'll put my get if you if you comment below and let me know you want to play some Helldivers 2. I will put my gamer tag in a, in a reply comment. We can link up sometime, play some Helldivers 2, because I am down to, to to dive with some folks that are out here also on Dive the into liberation. Hell. You know, out here wanting to give these bugs, these robots, uh, a nice high, hot pup, uh, pipe and cup of liberty. Quick, I'll be, know what I'll, I'm saying? So. I'll be right back. I'm just walking away from that joke entirely. But I'll be right back. <laughs> So, uh, but Helldivers 2 is a lot of fun. If you're not playing it, please do. It's a, it's a blast. Uh, and excited for the final season two to come out this week. Actually, by the time this releases, it'll already have been out. So, yes. 
Um, also entertainment news and Jonathan, I think you can join me in on this because you you got your chance to to be close to the stars this time. Uh, is uh, the Oscars Somewhere. were this past week? Uh, <laughs> uh, congratulations to the winners. Uh, friggin' Oppenheimer swept swept up <laughs> most of them. Yeah, and poor things did well too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Emma Stone. Really well. Congrats to Emma Stone. I still wish it would have been Lily Gladstone, but I like I from what I hear, Emma Stone is like the shining light of poor things. So good for her. That yeah, she, Killers uh, of the Flower the Moon won nothing. It went home with zero awards. Conspiracy. Which is sad. Conspiracy. You know what I'm saying? The one one movie about Native Americans didn't win nothing. And it's made by a white man. It's made by a, 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 on top of that, not just any white man, an Oscar darling. Made by Martin Scorsese. That man always cleans up a little bit in the Oscars. Didn't win nothing. I'm calling conspiracy. <laughs> 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 but, but Ryan uh, Gosling's performance, he killed that. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've never seen an Oscars performance that produced and that involved. Uh, that was... That was like a Grammy performance. Yeah, I still wish they could have seen him win it. But again, I think, our, like we said in our Oscars video, which should be out before this comes out, but uh, our Oscar predictions video, which is coming out after the Oscars. But uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. definitely like does deserve an Oscar for all of the work he's done. He's an amazing actor. So good for him. Good on him that he won it. Um uh, same thing with Killian Murphy as well. And Divine Joy Randolph. Congrats to her as well. She was uh, amazing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. She she was tearing up when the nominees or the presenters for the nominees uh were talking about the each uh like they had for each acting role, they had or each acting category, sorry, they had previous winners present to the current nominees and they had um, one person for each nominee. So like, for example, uh, Regina King, she talked about Davine Joy and um, her performance and everything. And they had different actors. Jamie Lee Curtis was up there, uh, different actors who have won in that category. Uh, and Davine Joy Randolph was crying. She was bawling before the, the winner was even announced when Regina King started saying her story and everything. Um, about her she she started bawling so you knew she was going to give a heartfelt speech when she eventually won yeah so good on her uh also congrats to billy eilish and phineas i swear they're gonna win if they're nominated they're winning that oscar for original song it don't matter what it is <laughs> uh, they're gonna e- at least billy billy she's gonna egot soon mm. she's she's gonna get that I think she just needs the Emmy and no, does she have any? No, I don't think she has one. I don't think she has an Emmy. No, she needs or that Tony. Emmy and she needs the Tony. She got the Oscar and the Grammy, which are some of the hardest to get. I feel like. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oscars are hard to get. Like mm-hmm. I think not that the others are easy, but like Grammys, of- you can kind of get lucky and just have a year where like nobody's touching you. You know what I mean? And there's and then, a lot of Grammy categories. There's a lot of Grammy awards. Right. You can win on a lot of stuff. And then, like, the Tonys, it's, like, is very hard, too, I feel like, though, too. Because you got to be, like, not only do you have to, like, stand out, but you got to, like, be the leader <laughs> in the or, in the category where you stand out at. Yeah. Or you can win for producing. That's true, too. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'm still going about his week. No, we're talking about the kind Oscars. Of- and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we're, we're transitioning we're transitioning also uh, though you know, uh, i am also uh <laughs> glad that the one i did predict that did win american fiction for adaptive screenplay yeah glad i was for that. happy I was it was happy beautiful yeah there was some black people that were mad american fiction won. like i saw i think it was a, a huffington post uh article um someone wrote that said this is uh, american fiction won for best adaptive screenplay this is why this is a problem. I didn't read the article because I'm like this in BS. I need but. to write read the read the uh, that because I'm just like, uh, what is the problem? Like, not only is the book written by a black person, but also it's about black people, and it's like, and we as black people have been consistently asking for more movies and more TV shows that show us in a different light and tells a different black story. You can't get more different than this. <laughs> 
I've never seen black people portrayed in this way in a long time. The closest I've seen is like in any project made by Issa Rae or Donald Glover. That's pretty much it. <laughs> or um, uh, her name starts with an L. And I, I always forget her name, but she's amazing Lena too. Yes, Lena Waithe. Yeah. Um, anything made by those three is like going to be a unique, different black story. But otherwise, <laughs> especially not Oscar movies. Yeah. I don't know what you want. People Not that they speak everything. for the black populace, yeah. but you know. <laughs> oh, sorry. What'd you say, Alex? But the problem is when you, because a lot of times people of color's movies have been held back for so long, it's hard for us to progress up that chain because we haven't been given the time, the respect for those type of movies. We do want to make that we could have a better voice in portraying. So when we do get something out, people always automatically be like, well, for our community, it's like, we haven't had this chance for our community just yet. We're trying to get to that chance. You can't expect everything to be grade A, you know, when we're just trying to put something out that tells a story at least. Hell, yeah. speaking of that, actually, I want to put a game, uh, put a movie out there on um, on people's radar that's coming out or uh, that came out in 2023 that I want to watch now and I'm sad I missed, which is The Long Game. I don't know if you guys have heard of that movie. Uh, it's Oh, uh, I thought you were going to say something else. Uh, yeah, it's a I was movie. trying to think the only game I've heard of, like, that's, but I'm like, no, that movie's called Players. It's on Netflix. Uh, some stupid, like, rom com movie. Go oh, on. yeah, I have heard of that movie. Uh, no, The Long Game, it's about uh, five young Mexican American caddies out of the love for, out of love for the game are determined and learn how to play. So they created their own golf course in the middle of South, Te- of a South Texas desert. And it's about uh, these Mexican American kids during the fifties learning how to play golf and becoming like one of the uh, one, like beca- uh, basically making their own golf club um, and stuff. And it stars Jay Hernandez and uh, Dennis Quaid. It it looks really great. I saw a trailer for it the other day, and I was like, "Where did this movie come from? I did not hear about this movie at all. I haven't heard and about it. It looks at all. amazing, and it's got like five stars. Like people really like it. And I'm like, where was this movie? I haven't heard of that at all. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, Same, so it's like, but I also it's like, tend to avoid anything golf related. I was just talking with a coworker um, <laughs> last week, and he was like, because <laughs> we were looking, we had seen a, a a commercial for a show on Netflix, like a documentary on Netflix about golf, and he was like, "Who wants to watch anything about golf? Golf is the most boring sport you could ever watch, especially on television." And I'm like, you know what? I kind of agree golf is uh if you ever watch it is actually one of the most homoerotic things i have ever watched in my life not because of the actual players but because of the announcers i have never heard an announcer describe a player's body as descriptive as golf announcers do (laughs) and i caught that just one day i was like leaving for work i'm like oh shit i'm late i'm late all of a sudden i hear Look at those arms. Look at the way they lean down. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and the way he was describing, I it was like years ago, the way he was just describing the player's body, I literally stopped in my tracks. I'm like, is is this normal? Is Does he know his mic is on? That's like detailing. And I think he even went, mm, at one point. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. This is, I, what's going And it is, actually. If I wa- I've watched a few more golf games. I'm like, I feel like they just, they think nobody's watching golf or something. And they just lo- allow their announcers to go wild. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Nobody's listening. It's okay. Everybody's watching the games. It's like, no, no, no. Your mic is on. I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> but I just like, I just want to put it on people's radar because it's like, you know, we don't get, there's not a lot of Mexican-American, like, yeah. about their history uh movies and so i'm like yeah because it reminds me a lot of like pride i don't know if you've seen that movie of bernie mac and terrence howard where it was like they're the first all black oh, swim meant, like, team month. yeah <laughs> and uh and no uh no it's a movie about an all black swim team in the during the 60s and it's very like a swim team bruh like <laughs> But it's like, listen, these are important stories too. All right, they matter yeah. too, and so it's like that. Like I, I, I uh, look forward to watching this movie, The Long Game. Um, but anyway, those are the Oscars. Jonathan, how was your week? It was good. Um, speaking of the Oscars, contrary to um, what I posted on Instagram, where I just happened to post at the time of the ceremony, and 
I just happened to post that I was on the red carpet. I was not at the Oscars. Uh, <laughs> I was not at the event. I was on the red carpet, which was really cool. Um, but I saw no stars other than um, the wax stars because I was in the area at the time, but I was in my jeans and a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so that was my, that was most of my weekend, um, so, which was pretty cool. Uh, and then what else? Oh yeah. Traders. Uh, it ended. We had the season finale, uh, of Traders, and I don't know if anyone plans on watching it. I no, do. So I, I do. Was, Oh, you do? Okay. I won't spoil I do, yeah. I won't, not, I do not I watch split. it. Uh, okay. Don't, yeah, don't. I, won't, I only got to watch, like like I said, life has been very crazy this la- like the beginning of this year till now. And I, every time I'm like, oh, man, this year's crazy. It's March. And it's <laughs> March. But I do plan on watching it or finishing it. Um, But it was good. It was good. It was a good finale and good reunion as well. Nice. Um, also, Love is Blind had their finale episode and then they're going to have the reunion this week, this Wednesday. So I cannot wait for the reunion. Yeah. Was Jimmy uh, still got soul? So, okay. So I, a couple weeks ago, I talked to you guys about Jimmy and Chelsea and how Chelsea lied and said she looked like Megan Fox. And then Jimmy had a problem with that. <laughs> uh, well, spoilers. Sorry, go ahead. Alex. Sorry. No, I saw a TikTok where somebody's like, everybody keeps uh, ragging on Chelsea for being like, I look like Megan Fox. They're like, they need to start ragging on Jimmy. To why he that man think he deserves somebody who looked like Megan Fox. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That too. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he didn't think that when he got in the pod, but he was just like, he, like she's like, well, she said it. Then I started thinking it. And just, and just one thing led to another. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can picture myself with someone like Megan Fox. Could you though? <laughs> Could you really though? But sorry, go on. Um, but surprise, surprise to no one, they did not make it to the altar. They broke up like a week before they were supposed to make it to the altar. They lasted a lot longer than people expected them to. They made it to like episode, the last episode. Um, but, uh, it was just very, uh, volatile. Um, she would always start fights with him about nothing. It would go seemingly well. And then, uh, they would have an argument about nothing. Um, he went to like a birthday party or something for an hour. First of all, how are you only at a party for an hour in LA? It takes like an hour for the commute, like between getting there and coming back. Yo, that's an hour for real. Yeah. Last time I was in LA, I went to a, uh, Warner brothers thing and it took me an hour to get there. The traffic was so bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this mm-hmm. was Wednesday. It was a Wednesday and traffic was trash trying to get there. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to my Uber driver, though. He he did his damnedest to get me there, there <laughs> as go. fast as possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he went out to this party. And then she uh, apparently he asked her if she wanted to go. And she's like, no, I'm just going to stay in. And then when he came back, she had a problem with him going out to the party. And she was like. <laughs> I know you saw Jessica there, the the girl that he was also interested in the pods. And he was like, she wasn't even there. And she was like, uh, yeah, and your your best friends are girls, and you effed one of them. And he was like, I told you this off camera, and why would you bring that up on camera? And <laughs> I told you that in private. <laughs> uh-huh. So eventually they have this like date at uh, an amusement park and they're having a great time and everything's going swimmingly and then they have dinner or whatever at the end and she's like um or he says uh can you see us you know can you see yourself saying yes at at, at the altar and then she's like you know what i i i think i can and then he's like well you know what i can't Ooh, so yeah, I, now that I saw on TikTok, and I was like, "Dang, that's some cold shit." <laughs> he set her He's up, like, nope. and then knocked her down. Like, <laughs> he just—he was like, "I I want her to say. I know she gonna say yes. She she ain't ready for this shit. <laughs> she she ain't ready for she ain't ready for the one two punch. I'm gonna hit her with the Nyquil, the one to put her to sleep, and then the Dayquil, the one that wakes her up." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah. So that that was that. Don't even get me started on Clay and AD or uh, what's his name? Uh, Laura and Jeremy. Don't even get me started on them because they're also a mess. But uh, yeah, I figured I'd just round out the Jimmy and Chelsea story. When do they it actually see each other? Sorry, when do they see each other in like Love is Blind? Is it like the third episode, second episode? Uh, so it's usually like the, it depends. Because uh, the first like four to five episodes are the pods. Um, and then people start getting engaged. Apparently they're in there for the same amount of time, but they show... They, like, edit it so that couples that have, like, a strong connection, like, couples that hit it off, like, right off the bat, they, you see them get engaged and meet each other earlier. So, there might be a couple that meets each other on episode two, and then another cup, another pair of couples meets each other on episode three, and then another two couples meets each other on episode four. But they're, they're typically in there, in the pods for about 10 days. So, they get okay. engaged to each other after 10 days. Which is why all this mess happens. <laughs> Ten days of talking to somebody through a pod. I can see how that gets weird. How that can get weird. Mm-hmm. But okay, I was wondering that. Yeah. Can't like. So that's that, and also honorary mention. Uh, not about love is blind. Like switching switching gears, but honorary mention for uh, interesting things that happened this week. The weird Kate Middleton drama. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Yeah, I don't know what's up with that or what's going on with or who's doing what. Okay. Why? Why all of a sudden? So, Kate Middleton hasn't been seen publicly uh, since Christmas, like Christmas Day, and the uh, palace. Out, I, okay, the, I thought that's who you were talking about. Okay, gotcha. Oh, oh! There another Kate Middleton, you know? <laughs> right? No, it's just like I honestly like. Listen, I've I have been. I don't know if I've been vocal in this podcast, but I've always said I do not give a shit about the royals because <laughs> because in my head I'm like they're not royalty over here, so I don't need to know what's going on in their lives. <laughs> it's like I'm more worried about <gasps> this country I, burning to the ground. <laughs> I could care less about the royalty of another one. <laughs> this this has just been especially today. I didn't care about it before today, just because people have been talking about it a lot today. But um, and I work from home, so it's like been on TV all day. Um, but she hasn't been seen in public since Christmas, and apparently she like in January or February or something like that. She had abdominal surgery, um, and then but she still hasn't been seen. So people are like, "Is she okay? What's going on?" Um, and then either yesterday or. Was it? Yeah, it was yesterday because it was Mother's Day in the UK. The royal family account, social media account, official account, posted out a photo of Kate Middleton with the kids, her three kids, which they're getting old, by the way. I they did not know how old so they are. So big, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, posted out a picture, and people immediately noticed that this picture was badly photoshopped like there's there's like hands that are blurry there's like different art there's things with the arms like in the background you can tell it's it's off and people are like what is going on someone even said that the face that they used for for kate was that of her um, Vogue cover from like ten years ago? So it's just weird. It's a it's a developing story, and I wasn't into it bef- before, but now I guess I'm kind of into it. I mean, I won't like follow it, but if if it comes up, I'll, I'll definitely click on something if there's more developing news. That's how I feel about it. I haven't really like searched anything, but when it comes up on my for you page, I do watch it because it's really weird. I've heard the rumors around it. People are like, "Oh, she got a BBL." <laughs> or something like that and like rumors like that i'm like okay of course those are just rumors and people are just talking shit and then they're like oh they sent out that photo i was like oh is kate middleton okay because that is a poorly shopped like photo and i was like all right they're just hiding her away now I wonder what's going on with her so it's yeah for me it's kind of like that but i saw that photo it's also her arm length but the <laughs> fact that she would have to be squeezing in the kids for her to reach but you know both of them so it's like mm. her wingspan is too far going on. Ah, see, Unless she had surgery you know, on the arms. She uh like Kate Middleton has been a a, 
a secret lizard person this whole time. I Got would say no arms and everything. <laughs> Have you guys ever watched the show I'm not on Netflix? That room. Inside... I'm joking. <laughs> We're all lizard people. Have you ever watched the show on Netflix Inside Job? I, I I've been wanting to watch it, but it looks it looks kind of terrifying. Heard it's really good. It's, I just haven't watched it yet. So funny. I wasn't prepared for it to be as funny as it was. And it takes a lot of the conspiracy theories that are surrounding the US government and been like, oh yeah, we did do them, but for not for the reasons you think. Uh <laughs> and it's they're like working for a company called Incognito Inc. And but there's also all these other conspiracy companies like the Illuminati exists and they're like the really cool one because it works with all the celebrities. But you have this one who tries to deal with like the US government and just it's a it's a funny show and it's kind of like I could see the U.S. government doing something like this, having a whole company to just mm. do conspiracy theories and cover-ups, and them all being nutbags too. <laughs> <laughs> madness, man! Yeah, madness. Well, speaking of madness, <laughs> Doom Part Two, Sand Madness. Yes, yeah, sand, <laughs> sand Madness. That's right. Doom Part Two: Colon Sand Madness. Uh, <laughs> That is, is what that we're going to be called? reviewing today. No. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, did I not notice that title? <laughs> um, that's what we're reviewing today. We're reviewing Dune Part 2. So uh, if you haven't seen it, maybe wait until you have to watch this. Or if you don't care about spoilers, you're going to watch well, it anyway. Or if you're not going to watch gonna it, We're not going to start with spoilers. It. We're well, going to start yes. with just our general if, thoughts. So do stick around for that because you're going to want to hear our general thoughts. I promise. And then we're going to get into spoilers. We're going to warn you and then go mm-hmm. into spoilers. Uh, oh, yeah. First, before we even get into first thoughts, did y'all buy that popcorn bucket when you watched it? No, I like having money and I didn't want to spend extra. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> on an extra I popcorn about bucket it. that I'm not going to use. Just going to be throwing away. I already got the Aquaman popcorn bucket from the last time I saw a movie with Alex right now that I'm using as my laundry room trash can. So, <laughs> And plus any of the other ones uh, that you collected from working at the Science Center. That's true. I did get a few. Uh, and it's just like... Nah. <laughs> I know. I thought about it for like a split second, but I'm like, I don't want my hand in there. I don't want to feel <laughs> that coming out. You know what I mean? It was like nothing. I, yeah, I didn't uh, either. Funny enough, though, uh, audience, uh, just so you know, if you have any new fans out there or whatever, we have done a review of Dune Part 1 as well. So go on back if you if you want. You can check that out as well. Alex had not seen Dune Part 1 yet. So it was mostly me and Jonathan recapping the movie to her. Uh, but this time, all three of us will participate in this review as all three of us saw the movie. <laughs> yes. Like uh, how you're pushing. All three of us have seen it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Collectively. Right. We've all had as our group. moments when we didn't watch something. That's true. It's true. I, I forget which and movie I didn't see the one time. It's kind of a fun experience because it's like you're explaining it to. <laughs> it was hilarious person. to explain Justice League to you, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the All critique was the slow mo. It's slow I actually thought motion. Of, when I was watching this movie and there was one part when they were doing slow mo, I actually thought about that for a second. I was like, hmm, this must be what Justice League was, but times 100. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, for uh, first thoughts, uh, Jonathan. You know what? You start. Go ahead and tell us. Uh, tell us what you thought about Doom Part Two. Okay, uh, I had heard. Oh, we didn't even go through the cast or anything. Oh, you know what? Whatever. You, right. you know what it is. You're right. No, no, no. Hold on. You're right. Uh, so the synopsis: for Doom Part Two. Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Fremen while seeking revenge against the co- uh, conspirators who destroyed his family. And this movie is uh, long as hell. It's two hours forty six minutes, <laughs> and it stars uh, one Timothy Chalamet, one Zendaya, one Rebecca Ferguson, and a bunch of other people. Uh, those are just to we name a few, because uh, this is a very star-studded cast of people. Good God, um, and they're all great. <laughs> uh, but are they great in this movie? That's the question. Jonathan, go ahead and tell us. <laughs> uh, short answer: Yes. Uh, long answer: I had 
talked to a few amount a few people who had who had seen this movie and heard different perspectives, uh, who said it was good. And so I was going into this movie feeling that it was going to be a good one. Um, I had walked into the theater right as Nicole Kidman was doing her thing. So I was like, all right, yes, I made it. Because I was rushing a little bit. I had uh, an issue with my AMC A-list. I had uh, booked a previous ticket, but I couldn't make it to that movie. But I didn't cancel in time. I thought I did, but I didn't push an extra button. And by the time I pushed the extra button, it was past the showtime. So AMC, if I wanted to get to a later showtime, AMC would have charged me like 22 bucks or whatever the um, cost was. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. So I walked into the theater right before the movie was about to start. I said, hey, I had this issue with A-list. They, I'm not about to get charged 22 bucks. Can I please Fair. have a ticket? So... They gave me a ticket. The lovely people at AMC. They gave me a nice. ticket, um, and I got Son of a, a bitch. I just realized something. I got a refund for a movie once. I could have watched this shit for free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, you still paid in a way. Yeah. Well, and now you now you have a, a free a, another movie you can watch. I just forgot I had that card. I keep forgetting it's in my wallet, <laughs> and I want to watch a free movie. Sorry, go ahead. I just thought. Oh that, no worries. But I, I got to see it in Dolby, and I got a decent uh, seat. All the other, all the seats except one uh, was was available, and I got that one. Otherwise, I would have had to sit in the front. So, uh, thankfully, I was going into this, you know, with a good mindset, um, and I felt like it lived up to uh, the expectations. It was enjoyable, riveting. I felt like. It was the story was told in a way that was not monotonous. Um, new characters kept getting brought in at what felt like an appropriate time. You didn't just get all of these people. You didn't just get introduced to all of these people or reintroduced to all of these people at once. It was like okay, we have these two characters who are right here. You have uh, Paul and Shawnee. You have. Um, uh, the bad people you have uh, the Harkonnens. Yes, you have uh this other group over here. Uh, so I felt like it, we were getting all of the information told to us or shown to us in a digestible way, which I appreciated. Um, at the very end, or sorry, ooh, I, I'm not going to talk about the end because we're not in spoilers. Um, but I loved the visuals. You know, that's that's probably what you come to see Dune for, for the most part, visuals. Uh, the fight scenes were really cool. Uh, just the, the scenes where you have a lot of people in a crowd were also really good. Um, so visually and I felt like narrative wise, it, it, it hit the mark. Hmm. Uh, Alex, what do you think about the movie? I feel like I wasted three hours of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like the movie. Um, did I pay to see this movie? No. Do I want my money back? Yes. It was just but what it, money did you pay for? She used it one of her wrote, AMC credits. Oh, sure, sure. Let's put it oh, that way. Okay, okay. I don't worry about it. Uh, well, no, it just it had a heavy vibe of like Game of Thrones mixed with Star Wars. It was just not something I was into. I guess when I'm watching sci-fi stuff, I'm like thinking actual like they're in space space. This was all, you know, to a certain planet, which, you know, Farron is about that particular planet. But it was just not something I was into. It had some visually beautiful shots, I will give it that, and some cool effects. Um, but it was just not a movie for me. I still haven't watched Dune Part 1. <laughs> <laughs> See, I feel like you gotta watch Dune Part 1. Hey, look, I can't uh, digest. It's just not something. Why, though? Because <laughs> a lot of the things that matter in this movie only matter because you saw the first part of the story. <laughs> I feel like, honestly, it wouldn't change that much opinion for me because I just, it just, yeah, it wasn't something I was really into other than also, the, like, the visually beautiful shots. You'll feel the needs for revenge because you'll no get to know Oscar Isaac's character from the first movie and how he died. And then you'll be like, I am with you, Paul. I too I wish to defend Oscar died. Isaac's honor. <laughs> I did watch how he died, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, on TikTok. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Plenty of people were showing that scene of his last moments, <laughs> whether it be for just the reasons of his last moments or, you know, other reasons. Not my concern. But I did see that scene. Did you and watch that scene to... for other reasons? I saw it on my TikTok and I watched it in full. Whether my <laughs> reasons be what they are or what they are not, it's not of your concern. Uh, so, but both your yeah, men's the... in that movie, Jason Momoa and Oscar Isaac. <laughs> but the, the movie just was okay to me. Uh, like I said, it was it was visually appealing, and I did enjoy watching that and the creatures. You know, the the sandworms. Uh, the the bucket did not do them justice. They actually look good in the movie compared to <laughs> what that bucket was. So the sandworms deserve, you know, some some credit for <laughs> or some retribution for what they were made to look like with that popcorn bucket. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it was just an okay movie for me. What about you, Jerome? Uh I uh thoroughly enjoy this movie. Um I think the best things about it is I'm glad we have a sci-fi movie like this out right now. Especially because Dune is like the OG sci-fi. <laughs> thing um like it's not older than stuff like star trek but it is like it is like this like really interesting sci-fi epic that is so much more thoughtful and interesting in the ideas of thinking about power thinking about um religion especially and religious propaganda and zealotry and all these things so i'm just like like it's like we don't get this shit in Star Wars. <laughs> we I mean we do, but we get it in the most basic form of like the Emperor's evil and they you know the rebels are the good guys and like this movie and this movie and, and Dune in general is the type of story that's like are the rebels the good guys? Are the is the emperor just outright evil? Who really like what is the definition of good versus evil really when That's you start to break it down? <laughs> actually something I've been seeing a lot of topic uh a topic of discussion is media literacy because nowadays a lot of times you need to come out right and say it, hey, this person's a bad guy to this person is like, you know, when it comes down to like queer characters or things like that. People are needing them. Uh, well, they didn't say specifically that they were, you know, gay or not. They spent 45 minutes for them with one character. They didn't need to say it. Or like, <laughs> oh, we didn't know this character was a bad guy. They they were doing bad things. You didn't need the main character to be like, oh, yep, that's the bad guy. It's the media literacy that apparently has been on a decline greatly where you need a lot more. Like like with Star Wars, these are the bad guys. That's it. And it's like, situations are much more complicated. Yeah, with Dune, I will give you that. Mm -hmm. And like to that point also, I have to say this because this is a thing that hit TikTok, especially in the black community of people. Well, not just black community, but just people of color community of people being like, this is a white savior movie. If you believe that this movie is a white savior movie, because I also need to issue an apology to dune on my behalf too because i made the joke uh, a couple weeks back saying yeah this is a white savior movie of course it is that's just me having some fun but in reality this is not a white savior movie and if you think that is that is the most surface level read you could possibly have of this film because there's so much going on <laughs> involving like paul not being a part of the fremen and the fremen people in general that is deeper than just like your mo like you know the average sci-fi movies we get all the time where the white man is the like true hero of the story and so it's like this is not a white savior movie there's a lot more going on than that and you need to really like analyze how you absorb media if you just like if what people tell you on paper is what you just believe it to be when you're watching a movie or a tv show but anyway uh acting wise the movie's amazing I love everybody's performance. Um, however, I will say this movie has a villain problem <laughs> because the villains, while the heroes are very three-dimensional and very interesting, a lot of the villains are very one note. They are just either really creepy or really shouty. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> There's no other depth past that, except for one person in particular. And that's because he's just a great actor and knows how to take this material and, and add some charisma to it. And that's Austin Butler, who's amazing in this movie. And I'm glad he got a chance to do it because, you know, I think people will always think he's Elvis before this movie. Now with this movie out, people might just see Austin Butler, the actor, as a man who can 
you know, fold into characters and really do a good job. Um, and then the cinematography and direction of this movie is flawless. I think D- Denis Villeneuve really understands the source material. He loves these books, clearly. And you can tell that with how much effort and love is put into all the se- special effects, all the regular cinematography that's just like, you know, stuff shot on location. Um, so just overall, I think this movie is amazing. And uh, if you haven't seen Dune Part 1 or Part 2, um, they are a package deal. I don't think you need to see Dune Part 1 to know what's going on in Dune Part 2, but it does help to like like bolster like understanding what's going on. But realistically, this I think this movie does a great job if you haven't seen Part 1 catching you up. And letting you know like what the conflict is and what the deal is. So, uh, and I think that's a great thing. I can, I can this- say it, it. You don't need to watch part one. I understand you may need to watch to understand what's going on. I understand you may need to watch part one to kind of create a emotional connection with certain characters, or to understand maybe to solidify the plot line a little better. But an understanding of what's kind of going on, yeah, you don't really need part one. Well, especially because part one is a lot of setup. And so it, it can feel, I can understand people who have said, and people did say it when part one came out that it was kind of boring because it's just a lot of people talking in rooms <laughs> and like, oh. uh, but it's like, and I, and I don't, I don't blame them for, for, uh, thinking that. And it's like, uh, but this one's a lot more action packed. A lot more of the characters get a lot more to do, especially Timothy Chalamet. Cause I remember even my criticism of the first movie was damn Timothy, like you gonna act today. Like at some point. Uh- <laughs> part one also came out during the pandemic. Um, it came out end of 2021. So, this, so we were still in the weeds of <clears throat> of COVID. I mean, COVID's still out in the streets, but we were in, in the thick of it back then. And, yeah. you know, HBO Max did a joint theaters and, or, H, or what are they called? Warner Brothers did a joint HBO Max and theaters release. So I mm-hmm. think people didn't really get, you know, the feel. Because sometimes I feel like Dune is is one that you need to oh, experience. Listen, when yeah. you're in the theater on the huge screen, and you a lot of people didn't get that Dolby experience. Cinema. Like they were just on HBO Max. Yeah, um, I watched it so, in Dolby, and it was good. Yeah, I did too. It was amazing. I, I like the sound was excellent, excellent. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, those are our overall thoughts. You got uh, two two positives and one uh, lukewarm to maybe a little cold. Uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, if you, you know, we're going to hop into the spoiler section. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't want to be spoiled, just go ahead and pause this. You know, don't 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 just leave out. Right. Pause this and then uh, go watch Dune part two and then come back and get you the rest of this podcast. Goodness, because I promise you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, but uh, if you don't care about spoilers, we're going to dive on in and uh, talk about some of this Dune stuff going on. Um, I, I first have to ask as the first spoiler question, was anybody thinking about that SpongeBob episode when they saw the worms and people riding the worms? Do you remember bit. that SpongeBob episode? I when not San- remember that. When Alaskan Sandy, bullworm. The Alaskan bullworm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I just, bar for bar. Yeah, I just thought about the... I got cops going by my place. I just thought about when Sandy was standing in the tongue and being like, oh, I caught it. so this is the tongue and the whole thing is the worm. <laughs> That's what I thought about when they came out of nowhere. I was like, oh. They're much bigger. Yeah, I thought about that. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't think about that. I did think about, like, cover your mouth, bruh. All that damn sand when he, like, dived into the thing. And just, poof, poof, look, <coughs> God, God damn. Well, hey, I'm trying to sc- ri- how the hell am I supposed to ride this shit? I can't see. <laughs> I'd be screaming, too, if I was. <laughs> On a giant worm? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's justified. I just also kept thinking about the way. Uh, Zendaya and Tony Shalley's character had to walk on the sand oh, because they had to do that the rhythm dance. You know, would wake up the sand so they're like slide and one step here one because they can do a certain rhythm I was like this makes that scene less intense when you're doing <laughs> well, like a little shuffle that, across the sand that was like also that. in the first part of the movie too so when they started doing it I was like oh yeah that's right the sand rhythm uh, gotta do a sand rhythm 
That's... Slide to the right, the left. <laughs> Slide to the right. I'm surprised right. that didn't come like become a dance on TikTok or something. <laughs> that looks ridiculous. It probably will at some point. Although, what do we think about uh, Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya's chemistry? Because I think it's okay. I don't oh, it's think not it's there. amazing. I thought it, was, I thought it was. I thought it was good. You thought it was good. I thought like I, I thought it's like in certain places it was cool, but I think I think it's just that uh, I don't know. It's just something well, about. I, f- their, I feel like their feel softer like, scenes are great, but the like harder scenes are where I'm like, eh, I don't I know. Feel like there was a, and maybe this is where it could have improved. There was uh, so at the beginning of the movie. So Alex Zendaya only had like five minutes of screen time in Doom Part One. For real, and, <laughs> and then y'all trying to get me to watch Doom Part One. Well, for Timothy what, you, you told me you're there for Zendaya. <laughs> I'd be. I would, yeah, and, she's a fantastic actress. No, um, she is, but uh, we all know. Okay, we all know you're there to see Jason Momoa and Oscar. <laughs> first of all, Jason Momoa, I can see him in anything. Oscar Isaac, yeah, I love him playing that <laughs> that kind of daddy role going on. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Oscar that. Oscar with but that I magnificent ass see... beard he had in the first movie. <laughs> he did. God damn, that man should never shave. But I would like to see Zendaya too. Her her on screen performance is always is always really strong, and mm-hmm. that's what I was saying about the chemistry. Both those actors do have an on strong uh, strong presence on screen presence. But when they were kind of together, kind of doing those more more intimate scenes and like scenes where they're kind of talk where they're just trying to show that there's a, a budding relationship growing it felt kind of weak compared so, to yeah yeah well with um so coming into this movie from zendaya's five minutes of screen time uh towards the beginning of the movie we automatically get to know a little bit more of uh shawnee and you know she has this very like tough exterior and you know she's not quick to let her guard down until it came to Paul. It felt like the guard was let down like very quickly, which yeah, I, I don't I don't real. know if, if if that if that suited her character quite the most. From what I know um, from the books, the is that she does little... fall for Paul pretty quick in the book mm. too. Well, this book was also written back in the seventies and eighties, so it's true. <laughs> Um, also, the kiss looked a little dry, but so maybe maybe the, chemi- maybe the chemistry. You see all that sand? As- they probably got sand in their mouth right now. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the chemistry wasn't as good as I had initially thought, but I I still think it was good between them. Not just like the physical chemistry, but I felt like the mental emotional chemistry was there. I think they played really well off each other when it came to scenes like about kind of political issues or like when she's kind of hype him up about like him being the messiah or the prophet or whatever they were calling it. But like, mm. yeah, just when they were just having those like intimate moments, it just kind of fell flat. And I think it was just because they're very strong in the act in the characters that they're playing that it's easy to bounce energy off the characters. You know, especially in those most more important scenes when it's trying to show the political shift and, you know, them trying to hype him up all the time being like, this is where you belong and stuff like that. So, but yeah, when it just came to that small moment, like the kiss where it was just like, you can, you can tell neither one of you really wanted to do this fully or like there was some energy that night where you're just like, all right, we just have to kind of get the scene done and move on. So that's where the like chemistry very fell, fell flat. And I can see why Zendaya, every time they asked her, who do you have more chemistry with on set? She's like, my boyfriend. <laughs> the days he came to visit him. <laughs> so like, fair Zendaya, fair. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I didn't really, I, I felt like they did do do well in scenes together but just their relationship chemistry was the only thing lacking for me but they but they clearly had like and it's because both of them are just really good actors um well and and we hinted to it oh go ahead sorry i was just gonna say we hinted to it uh when we talked about it last week how if you look at interviews of the cast um that they've that they've had over the past few weeks People have said like they look like they're the definition of work friends. Like it feels like they they clock in, they say, "Hey, how's it going? Let's shoot this scene." All right, cool. Have a good one. See you tomorrow. It's, it feels very much See, like the cast is like that. It's because 
like desert movies have that effect because also you know what another movie that had the same thing even though people were like man this movie's amazing but you heard stories of how the cast uh didn't quite get along and things were a little tense mad max fury road like the the reportedly tom hardy and Shirley Theron did not get along very well at all and i'm sure half of it is because of the damn heat they filmed that shit in an actual desert <laughs> Good so it's just like, look, you need to get your lines right. We are, it is hot out here. It's 165 <laughs> degrees outside. <laughs> could, so I yeah, feel like I'm sure like, Dune was the same way. They're like, it's hot. <laughs> Can you please get your scenes together? <laughs> well, a good, in all fairness, a good chunk of those actors stayed in cool, shady areas. That is true. Most That's of it true. was filmed yeah. on green screen and in studios. But still, and, I'm but just I, like, I, I, it's hot I feel like, I feel like another reason... <laughs> I feel like another, and I'm not, and I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's saying that they didn't have chemistry. It's just that you, oh no, you could, it just wasn't as strong as you would, you would think it would, right? Need to be. And you well, can tell, you can tell, like in the interviews and stuff. But I feel like maybe because they also like, there were a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, individual moments where, like these two characters would be talking, like Paul and his mom, Paul and Shawnee, um. Javier Bardem and Paul, Paul basically Paul with the, anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so you didn't you didn't get a lot of like the, the the group together for for many of the scenes. Yeah. Another thing I noticed about the because you we mentioned uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League, how we were describing it to you with slow motion. There was a lot of silhouette shots in this movie. A lot of like pulled back from like Paul standing, you know, on the desert uh, sand to Zendaya See, and character and Zendaya I and Paul's it. character. Yeah, right there. And then the fight scene, just everything was constantly like background characters pulled back. That was a lot of the shots for this movie. That's all I kept thinking. I was like, you ever just kind of stay with the character <laughs> for like a second? Finish, let them finish talking. Do we need to pull back so You're much? Like, can, so I often? A, can I stay on a close up? Yeah. See, but I like that. I like a movie that's not so wrapped up in filming everything so boring, like so like one note. Um, I love those silhouette shots, especially the one where he's walking in the desert and he's got his cape, well, his rags blowing in the wind. And then the worm pops up behind him like, yeah, we in this together, baby. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, see, like, that's different. That showed, yeah. But like, a I felt like a lot of scenes were like, okay, you know, the conversation's not that interesting. So look, look at the beautiful vast lands. Look at the cool scene. That's what I felt a lot of those shots were doing. Like, you know, this conversation's not really interesting or, you know, this movie's getting a little boring. So look at the cool background. Look at it. It's pretty. <laughs> That's what I felt sometimes when they, they did that. They were trying to distract me from the boring conversation that was going on. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of Paul, though. What do we like? Because normally we always like we oftentimes we forget about the main characters because we often talk a lot about the boring characters. What do we think about Paul? Uh, Paul, especially Alex, I'm curious about your take on Paul because our description of Paul for you from Doom Part One, you were very much not feeling Paul Atreides. Uh, but you now you've seen the movie the where he gets to do a lot it's more the stuff. It's the name. I can't get over so. the name. I don't know why the, the writer did that <laughs> to everybody. It flows. Well, getting... Paul Atreides. <laughs> it has a great flow to it. Paul I think she Atreides is a basic a name. It is a basic name. Right. You might as well so be named Bob. So is, remember, so remember my Jessica. issue with Bob in the Walking Oh, yeah, such a problem with Bob. <laughs> like, there's no black man named Bob out there in the world. But also, I, I did say that. I did, yes, you, you kind of did. You said there there is no chance a black man is named Bob. No, I'm sure there are black Bobs out there. I don't know if there is. I, I'm pretty sure he may be named Robert. His ass definitely ain't named Bob. <laughs> okay, I bet there's a black man named Bob. You can find him. That sounds like a book too. <laughs> black, a black man, man named, Bob. named Bob, yeah. <laughs> or there's black women, and their their nickname is Bob, but her name Barbara or something like that. <laughs> oh my god, Abbott Elementary is getting funnier. I love that they've been doing lately. The, the, <laughs> off topic, off topic. Um, he, Let's he's see Quentin in Dune Three. <laughs> Sorry. <anyway>. Yeah, <laughs> that's her, do that. The sandworms are like kindergartners. <laughs> Uh, like it's okay. His character, his character is the definition of people need to understand media literacy. So, because it's the same way, and I saw this comparison, and I was like, "That's pretty good." 
a lot of people had a problem with the Dark Knight when Batman started doing like surveillance on people. And it was the whole like, well, that's not that's not Batman. That's not a hero thing to do, blah, blah, blah. That's the whole point of it is that it's going from, you know, you die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That's the kind of story this thing is going to. He originally was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the good guy. And it's the shift into I'm using now the pol- uh, political environment. I'm using religious reasons. I'm fulfilling a quote unquote prophecy, which everybody has been like, it's like, does this prophecy actually exist and you fit it? Or has the prophecy been built around you so that it fits? Mm-hmm. And yeah, with his character, definitely media literacy is needed for this movie for you to understand. He's not the good guy. He's turning into what he sh- he was originally supposedly fighting against. Mm-hmm. And his character, I think, is pretty well created. And I think Timothy Chalamet actually does a pretty good job with him. I still have a problem with the name. And some of the fighting sequences, I don't know, they gave very much like on guard style instead of like real fight scenes to <laughs> me. Oh, like... <laughs> yeah, like, let's fight. And it's like... I will say they're very choreographed and it's a thing where like, cause I remember um, when star Wars, the prequels came out, a lot of people's criticisms about the lightsaber battles were that like, unlike in the first star Wars movies where they clearly didn't have like a real fight coordinator, like the fight coordinator is basically just like, I don't know. They're light sticks. Just smack into each other. I don't really give a shit. (laughs) So it was like, it was, they were coordinated, but it looked raw. It looked real. Like a yeah. real person trying to swing a sword, as opposed to in the prequels, where it looks like so choreographed to like, let watch me spin my lightsaber around and do all these fancy moves. Hiya! And people th- felt like it took them out of the experience because, okay, you clearly are very like choreographed and trained to like do right. these specific and moves. I saw, I did see in the first 15 minutes of the first dude about how he's trained and about how the person training him is like, oh, you have to be ready to fight at a moment's notice. It doesn't matter if you're in the mood, you fight. But like when that fight scene came, uh, when he's fighting Austin Butler's character, he gets into a straight up fencing position. He's like in a proper like, yeah, like fighting a, position. He gets into all... a Fremen pose. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, this doesn't, this feels like you guys are going to have a choreographed fight. Because a lot of fencing is is not choreographed, but it almost looks at it. It is well well done, but you're also not fighting with fencing swords, so that's why it also looks a little off. And then I didn't like that whole um, may your sword chip and break, may your knife chip and shatter. Yeah, yeah. I was like that is not as bad a line as they were trying to make it out to be. I like it. I think it's. I think it's kind of cold and. And clean a little bit, you know, just the idea of like, you know, hey, listen, we go, we're going to go out here, and uh, may you, uh, may may your your, your steel be strong, because <laughs> if it's not, that's your ass. <laughs> I guess I guess it all felt like very formal fighting for kind of like they were supposed to be like it kind of not See, not dirty fighting, but like it was just all felt very formal fighting when it should have been like you're kind of trying to take over an empire, maybe just. You know, dirty See, tricks. But I like stab that. Back. I like that because it's like it shows Paul. Like, is the whole mo- the, most of the movie Paul's turning away from his like empiric, like royal teachings, and then here it is in the final battle, he returns to it, and it's like it's showing like Paul kind of turning his back on everything he just learned <laughs> over the whole movie. Is him going back to the? Yeah, I, you know what? I am the son of a duke. I'm going to take this empire over. <laughs> Which he did yell at one point. I'm the son of a duke. He actually yelled at a couple times. I'm the son of a duke. We get it. We <laughs> I, I love that scene when he's like, and there's a TikTok. Uh, so um, I forget her name, but she's great that she posted where she's like the beginning of the movie. Paul is just like, oh, me? No, I don't want to be. I want to be a savior. You guys should be the saviors. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not about that. Five seconds later, after he drinks the water of life, I wish one of y'all would come up in here and challenge me. Not one of y'all could touch me. I'm Paul Atreides, son of the dude. <laughs> it's just, well, just okay. talking all that I, if, shit. If I, if I could provide a, a criticism, I think that was one of, I guess one of mine is that I, I want to put it more on uh, the performance versus how it's written or the story. Um, 
he very Paul very much went from zero to a hundred real quick. Like even yeah, yeah, in no some of the dialogue, like the one scene where he was um talking with his mom and she was trying to get him to I don't know if this was a part where she was telling him to drink the stuff or if it was before that, but uh she was like, Yeah, no, I know the like, scene you're talking to, about. Yeah. And yeah, and, and then all of a sudden he just screams out. I forget what he screams, but all he of says, a sudden that's he, not hope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yes. I provide help. I that is that I also felt the same way. I was like, I God was like, well, chill out, why are we dude. Screaming? Like, why, why are, we screaming? are you yelling? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I swear you can see the Fremen who are packing up her stuff look over like, what in the world is going on up there? What the hell's wrong with him? <laughs> He's just okay. yelling all of a sudden, yo, hey, Paul, you all right? You good? <laughs> we, can, we can stop packing the stuff if you need to take a minute. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And I was like, oh, did we? And maybe it's also because... I'd be interested to see Timothy Chalamet in a villain role because I'm I'm, in, I'm curious to see how far he could take it because I, in most of his roles he he's usually playing the pr- protagonist um, and I feel like he plays a good protagonist but I'm not sure how how well he plays a villain um, I I I don't know how imposing or how sinister he could really get so I I'm I'm curious to see how he could play a villain because the mom- at the end of Wonka he got really sinister <laughs> no well, i haven't seen really Wonka yet. Okay. I haven't he, was seen like, he was allowing those men to float off into space hey, wait spoiler he just I smiled. haven't seen Wonka. B, but like he you wasn't seen like Wonka? you saw Wonka did we I haven't do the seen review? it yet. no he did I, not he's, I didn't he, do the like review. remember he was, was a, part of the review for all of up until the part where he, where he oh, said that's right. you just like ditched us well, he got sinister at the end of Wonka. I'm going to tell you that much. That's your he interpretation. A, he did not he get that sinister at the end. Wait, okay, I'll, I'll, when he was I'll watching watch those three I'll men. watch it this week and then I'll, I'll come back no, to you guys. No, leave the and... podcast right now. Go watch it. Come back and we'll All discuss right. it. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'll just watch the end. No, yeah. I agree that um, I think Timothy Shall. I like the scene after he drinks the water of life because it's like there is implications that the water of life changes him. Which is why he challenges them like that. The but the line before that, when he's just like, "That's not hope," I was like, "Who the hell? like?" First of all, I'm like, "You better be glad, Lady Jessica ain't black," because she'd be like, "Who the hell you think you yelling at?" <laughs> would have would have snatched you up on that damn mountain so fast. They're like that would have been the end of the legend of Paul Atreides right there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, uh, I think. I think it's it's a weird scene. It's just a weird scene, and I like, but I I think it's supposed to illustrate, and I and to your point, um, of why he flies off the handle so much. I and uh, I've been hearing that apparently some of the book fans do not like this film, and the reason why it's not so much because the overall film isn't good, but because there's some small details that aren't in this movie that they feel like would have been good to have and would have explained a lot more of like some of the stuff like one of the things that i had like or i learned doing a little bit of research after watching the movie was how impactful the Benny Gesserit have been and how um i mean it's in the movie that is clear that they like instilled this prophecy in the fremen as like a backup plan to be able to control these people but it doesn't it doesn't illustrate for a large part of the story how ingrained this prophecy is into the people until we get into the later parts of the movie. And in the book, apparently it's a lot more clear, which is why Paul freaks out and he's very angry with Lady Jessica of being like, you are messing with these people's heads and yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> and like, and so it's, so it's like, it's a thing where it's like, I think that was supposed to be a scene to emphasize how Paul really is, like he's been trying to play it cool, but he like her finally saying her bullshit has like it's pushed him to the edge where he's like, "Good look, god dang it, I'm sick and tired of this. Like, I'm tired. Me and my well, beautiful a- black girlfriend are sick and tired of what you got, all the things you're trying to say right now." <laughs> I would start a war for her, uh, but I think it's also the fact that he's getting told all these things of like, "Oh, you're gonna be the next ruler. You're gonna be," and then they do these things where they keep things from him. And they treat him still like this child after telling him, oh, yeah, you're a ruler, you're a prophet. And then like, oh, yeah, but you can't know about any of this other stuff. And then he finds out about this other stuff. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? 
<laughs> he's like, are you serious? Like, you just had this whole discussion, and now you're like, oh, just do this. No, don't tell me to do something. Not after everything we just went through right now. Do not tell me what to do. Type of energy he's got right now in the earlier part of the film. Mm-hmm. So he's, uh, like, while we're on the topic of Lady Jessica, though, what do we think about Rebecca Ferguson as Jessica in this movie? Because she gets so much more to do in this movie than she did in the first one. <laughs> yeah. Like, a lot. I mean, she's... And she's, a complete character arc and change. Yeah. Really she has cool. a whole whole thing, becoming the Reverend Mother. Um, and, uh, and now we got her to baby. see her sinister side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I love like how like sinister she gets and you like especially when there's like that nightmare that paul has where people are like like there's like decimation and people are starving and then it's like i'm following this woman and then you find out lady jessica and i was like that's really cool and interesting because up the the first movie you think lady jessica's like no she's his mom she's really cool she's trying to keep him safe and uh, you know and help him learn how to use his powers like she like it's whatever and then for her to have this heel turn in this movie where you're like dude she's like Evil. the joker <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's, she's super sinister as hell and now she's basically like made a whole order that rivals the benny jesuit order and it's just like dang that's that's crazy um especially when you find out also that she's the daughter of the baron and you're like, that's that's where the evil comes from. She gets mm-hmm. the evil from her daddy's side. That's what it is. <laughs> like the darkness those, is coming from him. <laughs> those are his cousins. <laughs> For real. <laughs> uh, I think she plays the character really well. She has a very regal touch to her throughout this whole film and her character. She does feel like she's like royalty in a way. So she, she holds herself so well for this character. Her walk and everything is just very like, oh, yeah. I could see you being a, like a queen or a or a countess or whatever i don't we should say they call her a lady but what's her actual title she technically is like the queen she is like married to duke yeah Lito. right so yeah so she's got um, a real she was able to bring a real so i guess she's a duchess actually she's a duchess i think it's weird that on an alien planet they have uh monarchy titles <laughs> well think? it's more like the same thing of like like much like you were saying like Game of Thrones like this is Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones and the idea of like it's not so much that the planet has monarchy but more that in this empire the duke has been awarded this planet as his home planet <laughs> of like That's like right. much like how in a kingdom it's like hey duke of whatever you can have this stretch of land as your land to dictate and do with Does as Earth you wish. exist in this world? I don't think so. No. So who's giving him the planet? The emperor. Like Where's, the emperor Walker's character. Character. Where's the emperor? Where's the emperor residing? Oh no, that I do not know. I don't know all See, the Dune stuff. I, th- I know he's okay, like on another like, planet, but I don't know what the planet's called. There aren't there like in the books? Don't they have maps of the planets and stuff? I think so. See, I think I would have. I I think that would have helped me connect more because like because I kept thinking I was like who who's he was, I know the emperor's in power. I'm like, but is he like the emperor of Earth, solar system? Like, yeah, no, I kept also like, thinking this is... of like the Galactic Federation from Star Trek. My mind always <laughs> goes there as my like basis. So I was like, is there like a whole, like he's in control of all these planets and then he's just giving them out to friends? I mean, this is more like mm-hmm. on the level of something like a Star Wars, where it's like, it almost is right. in like solar systems untapped. Because, it, but unlike Star Wars, where it's like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, this is more like, no, in the year 10,000, whatever, whatever, like we've evolved past. Like Earth, if Earth does exist, we've long since left it behind. And we're like in, we're on to other things. Like That's all like, on. this gives Games of Thrones meets Star Wars energy a lot. Mm-hmm. Both, I no, I've watched Game of Thrones. I have not. I've wa- I've watched most of Star Wars too. I fall asleep during that movie. I'm sorry, I can't stay awake. <laughs> that movie puts me to sleep. But I think she played her character really well. All of them, like I said, it wasn't the acting I had any trouble with in this film. I think they all played their parts extremely well. Austin Butler's character. I, you didn't he even recognize him. The makeup team did an insanely good job. He oh, he's that. great. It's funny he though. transforms. Yeah, it's funny though. Whenever, and I've noticed this, and I was thinking about it during the movie. Whenever you have someone who you want 
the audience to feel their presence. You want them to know that they are a strong character. You always got to introduce them with a shirt off. They always. Gotta- <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't think that's where you were going. Listen, it's more like listen. When we like we hired Austin Butler, you think we not gonna let him show off these abs? Okay, the man worked hard to get those. We showing them. <laughs> like- <laughs> but also, Fade Rotha though is uh, from what I've learned um, from like hearing people talk. Apparently, he is a very like sexual creature like he's um like he has a bunch of concubines and stuff that he does with whatever he wants as shown in the movie where like they're like like, which i'm like that poor judy that day just came there to be his concubine and then (laughs) here it is all they did was just be like hey what's going on fade uh listen brother we got you some new knives for your birthday you know what i'm saying it's a fresh birthday present right here these some these are sharp knives too are they sharp huh hey judy slash (laughs) what the what did Judy do? She didn't do anything. <laughs> All she was doing was standing there. <laughs> and then he slashed the guy who gave him the knives because they weren't uh, sharp enough. Well, he's testing their sharpness, I guess. I don't understand. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> this he feels- was just in a slashy mood, I guess. I'll- I know the Harkonnens really do be because also Batista, every time people would be like, listen, man, I'm just saying we're trying the best we can out there, but like, like, you know, this Mo- Moadib guy, he's just out here killing. I want to hear that shit. Matter of fact, <laughs> like kills people. Yeah. It's like, it's like when, listen, all you need. When he, when he, was <laughs> Don't that bring him? him bad news. When he, uh, was this him? <laughs> yeah. When, when the guy was like, um, sir, uh, maybe you should, you should have some rest. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> just murders him. It's uh, like, I was just trying to give healthy advice, and then he killed me. <laughs> it's also like, oh, we need our numbers to be strong. Then stop killing your numbers. Right. <laughs> you need people to fight. Stop killing the numbers that you have. Stop going to the Darth Vader school of management. <laughs> just like they talk back, you need to kill them. What? <laughs> kill them what we need it? employees it was a family guy or right. snl episode where they were t- i think it was some i think it was like almost family guy where they're like no it, it was snl where they're like yeah darth vader thinks he kills us but like we're on a ship with an oh it's robot chicken find, yeah oh robin yeah we're, we have a finite <laughs> number of people if he really killed as many people as he did in a day there'd be nobody on this ship anymore <laughs> so you know we just let him think we're dead get carried off put on a mustache and get back to work <laughs> <laughs> this like it's just although uh speaking of the, the batista though austin butler for real punked dave batista Dude, poor dave batista because he's like a badass in the last movie <laughs> and in this movie he just is an incompetent manager on his best day and on his worst day he gets karate kicked <laughs> by austin butler <laughs> And has to kiss his shoes. <laughs> like, yeah, Cooley, kiss my converse. Go ahead, kiss him. <laughs> Not the converse. <laughs> uh, shout out to The Last Dragon. Maybe we'll review that movie one day. Because <laughs> I love that film so much. But uh, Austin Butler is, is, is incredible. It's got me excited because also uh, when I went to go see this movie, there was a trailer for The Bike Riders. I am excited for that movie. Now, like him and Tom Hardy in a movie together? Hell yeah. Like I'm down oh. for it, um, but uh, but uh, he just like and uh, they even the his cat the cast was like man when Austin got on screen because he's such a nice guy and we love working with him and then when he was like playing his character he's intense like he really like got into character and it was almost like kind of scary at times and I'm like that's really cool and it shows like he he put some work into playing this character I don't know if he read the books or if he was basing his performance off sting's performance from the 1984 movie but either way whatever he did to get into character he nailed it as like opposite paul atreides and in a lot of ways i feel like he's like the dark reflection of who paul could be if he lets like the the religious like t- like the religious like if beliefs and all this himself, stuff like yeah goes too if far he lets him still go the route he's going it's a reflection to show almost his future Mm-hmm. Like if you're continuing this route, this is what you're going to be. This unstable, angry man who just slashes at people for telling him to maybe take a night, you know, have a <laughs> cup of tea, have a rest. No, now you're going to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, that scene, too, was really cool. I love the shift to black and white for the Harkonnen planet. I thought that was really oh, cool. Yeah. 
and the I battle love the, scene in there. Yeah, the battle scene was great, and then the fireworks being ink blots. I've never seen that before, and that was such a cool idea, like a cool visual to kind of separate the Harkonnen from. And I, I think I, I what I love about it most is that I think this is a type of sci-fi movie that I love, and that it like really makes the place feel alien. Because a lot of sci-fi movies, like they're sci-fi, but it still feels like Earth, like Earth stuff. Like, oh, they go into a bar, and it's like, yeah, I mean, they, they're serving, like, blue juice, and, well, like, that, there's a few aliens, but it's still very clearly a bar, versus, that's why like, I brought here. up the whole monarchy thing, where it's like, that's very Earth. It's a very <laughs> Earth thing. But, yeah, um, them and their inkbots, really cool. Yeah, the whole Harkonnen culture just looks very sci-fi and almost otherworldly, which is really cool, even though it is real people. Like, they're normal people, but they're just, like weird and and they just keep getting weirder the more you find out about him i'm like what is that black goo that he's bathing in is it even for bathing like what is he what is he chilling in is that oil <laughs> what, what is that what are these three big balls of fluid that he has floating next to him is that for his health or is that just for pleasure or or both i don't know <laughs> like like it's just like it's just the more I, the more i see about them the more questions i have of like what is your culture how does it work? <laughs> How does it work? What is this goo? And can I drink it? <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to drink the goo? Speaking of drinking the goo, I really like the scene where um, you have the woman who actually, dis- I forget her name. None of these characters' names stick. But Unless the, you're Jessica or Paul. The, <laughs> except Paul and Shawnee. Um, <laughs> but uh, the lady who caught the worm and oh, uh, got uh, the got the got the water the, or the juice played by Allison Halstead as a maker keeper is her name. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a really cool scene where she's like actually catching it, um, and you see how the how the what's it what's the phrase? Uh, you see how the sausage is made. <laughs> oh yeah, really, yeah, the water of life. So mm-hmm. they speak. Also, uh, yeah, I love the, the <laughs> like. I'm like she's clearly pregnant or at least or no i guess she's not showing just yet but when she walks in there and they give her the water of life and they're like what have we done she's pregnant and i'm like i'm sorry did no one give you that information before you gave her the water of life? (laughs) because i feel like it's a very important detail you would ask of like hold on real quick before we give you any medicine just real quick if you just fill out this survey uh just tell us any medical history anything you got going on that'd be great before we give you the water i was like do you want them to fill out a survey or something (laughs) when was your last pregnancy (laughs) when was your last period (laughs) how bad were the cramps did you have a baby are you breastfeeding Mm -hmm. uh but I mean that, that, which that's a big thing in the in the story is uh, Lady Jessica's um, daughter. In fact, a lot of this happens, and the baby should already be born in this story. Um, in fact, the I found out from the books that uh, the Timoth the like Timothy no Paul's sister <laughs> is born, and she is the one who kills the Baron. Um, spoilers! In like a big epic moment in the book. Yeah, unfortunately, spoilers for Dune the book. Uh. <laughs> Wait, how old is this child when she kills the Baron? She's like three or two. But the thing is, and this is like one of those things where the movie again, they like they cut out some things. Uh, the water of life basically imbues you with the knowledge of all your ancestors, um, like all of the Benny Jesuit ancestors yeah. that have come before. So when Lady Jessica drinks it, because she's pregnant with her daughter at the same time. Her daughter also inherits the same knowledge that Lady Jessica has. So when she's born, she has, she has the body of a two three year old, two to three year old, but she has the mind of like a woman who's like a hundred or whatever because she's like all downloaded all of so, the knowledge uh, of her of so the ancestors. In the story, there's like her. this chucky sized child running around stabbing people. Only the Baron, because she's like, "You killed my father." <laughs> No, but she's like she's a she's just really smart and like really um powerful, just like Paul is, who's like also a Benny Jesuit child. Um but uh you know that's something that's like, not in the movie, so we're not gonna focus yeah. on it too much. I Lady just thought Jessica that'd be a fun just fact. Creating for you, chaos man. all around, really, with her oh, children. She's just like, I'm gonna start a war for funsies. <laughs> Although thinking of the really? Baron and stuff, that is my biggest issue with the movie, is just that the the I, I, outside of Austin Butler, who I think really 
takes the material and even though he doesn't have a lot to do as far as like emotionally being different he makes it work batista and stellan skarsgård on the other hand it feels like they're just here because <laughs> and it's Stella not their Skarsgård fault was in this movie he's the baron he plays mm-hmm. as the baron yeah that oh it's just really good go. makeup job um and he was in wow. the first movie as well but the two of them are just like they're so one note and especially Batista, especially because Batista just is like this angry dude who shouts a lot and runs away a lot until <laughs> uh, Josh Brolin comes in. And you're like, you're I, I remember like, here it is. Gurney comes up to and I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. Now. Now we're talking Gurney versus uh, uh, Raven. It's going to be, a um, you know, uh, a rematch because last time Raven whooped his ass. But this time he's coming back with a vengeance. Two seconds. Stab. <laughs> I was like, I, uh, well. Okay, I guess, I mean the movie is two and like over two and a half hours. I guess we got to keep it moving, but I was expecting more than that. Like all this setup, and this this man just died like that. Damn! <laughs> They're like, we just need to get rid of you, so we're just gonna you're just gonna go. You know what would have made it better if Gurney was holding a pug? That would have made it better. Because of Gibson, or is there a whole other reason? <laughs> no, in the so in the first in the old Dune movie back in 1984, uh, Patrick Stewart plays Gurney, right? Uh, which he also has one of the best lines in the movie when he's training Paul in the very beginning, and he's like, uh, uh, "I think he said like, what did he say? He's like, I he think he says like, I need like a rest or something like that." And he's like, "Rest is for cows and lovemaking. <laughs> like, get your ass up and fight." <laughs> See, I would watch the old Dune just for that line to see Patrick Stewart it's say that. It's a great line. I gotta, I gotta look it up and see what the exact line is. But anyway, um, there's also a thing where Gurney, uh, well, the Atreides family have a pug. Pug is not in the movie, or uh, not in the book at all. That's just something they made up for the movie, that they have a pet dog who is a pug. And so there's a scene where Gurney is like shooting with a friggin' machine gun when he comes back, you know, for like the the revenge against the Harkonnens. And he's got the pug in the other hand, like, ah! (laughs) And I'm like, that's the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life, seeing (laughs) Captain Picard out here just mowing down soldiers as he's holding a pug in his hand (laughs) and a machine gun in the other. I love that. (laughs) Apparently, people are asking, why didn't Patrick Stewart just play Gurney in 2020? I mean, that's true. He could have. I, I think maybe the action, uh, like, it's just like the amount of action he had to do. Um, I have faith Patrick Stewart like, could have done it. Same. He's still, like, pretty <laughs> pretty fit for his age. I wonder how old he is. He's, 90s, he's right? looked the same age since, since, like, the 90s. Patrick Stewart's one of those people that, like, He's aging. Sl- You've looked old for so long, but you're aging so slowly in your old age. Oh, he's like 83. Samuel. I'm sorry. Oh, he's oh, only here, 83? Oh. Wow. Yeah. Okay, he's here's the 90s. line. The line is, uh, Gurney says, we need to do shield, like he says, shield practice. And Paul says, again, Gurney, we had practice all this morning. I'm not in the mood. Gurney says, not in the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle and love play, not fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. See, they should have kept that line in this movie. That would have been For great. Real, I would have loved that line. Instead, they were just like, oh, you're not in the mood? You can't not be in the mood. This is war, or this is fighting, or whatever. Like, it, it's a great line, and I was just like, man, and the way Patrick Stewart delivers it, too, is just so matter of fact. He's like, like very much like a soldier. Uh, Patrick Stewart's the best part of the 1984 Dune, for me. Like, he's the best in that movie. He's he right. takes that movie and makes it work with all the best material. He's a fantastic um, actor. Uh, but yeah, that's just my that's my only thing. It's like I just didn't like the bit like how they treated the villains in this movie very well. Um, although speaking of the villains, a uh, character, uh, an actor who doesn't get a lot to do in this movie, and maybe will get a lot to do in the third movie, Florence Pugh is in this movie <laughs> as the daughter yeah. of the emperor. What do we think about Florence Pugh? If we have any thoughts at all about Florence Pugh, she was all right. I think she played her character very well mm-hmm. for yeah, the thinking- limited time she was given. Yeah, I th- I'm thinking she's going to be more important in the next movie. Although I will say that's that's some cold. Like we were talking about Jimmy earlier, we thought that like that was cold shit that Jimmy did. It's some cold shit to tell your girl, your girlfriend, or I guess uh, girlfriend you're on the rocks with, because it's not like they officially broke up. But he's just like, just so you know, I'm gonna love you forever, and I'm the, I ain't gonna never stop loving you. 
Now, if you excuse me, hey, I'm gonna marry your daughter real quick. <laughs> just, just in her face, right? <laughs> and Johnny like, looking like, are you serious? She I'm was like, spare my father, I'll marry ice. you. <laughs> I think her. I think they're setting her up to almost be like also the reflection of Lady Jessica and her part. I don't know which way they're trying to shift her though. If she's gonna be like. I'm going against my father or she is with her father or she's going a whole straight new game of like, yeah, I'm going to be the one who ends up on top. Really? Everybody, everybody's fighting their war. But in the end, I'm the one that's just going to kill everybody and then take the throne because well, I've never read Dune and everything. So but that's almost like kind of the vibe they were giving up because she was, you know, she's the daughter of the emperor. Emperor. She's very knowledgeable and everything like that. And she's the way she presents herself is very real and in charge. Mm-hmm. So I, I've i seen a lot of movies and tales that it ends that way, where it's like the character that's like, oh, you don't think she's really going to do anything. She's going to be married off and then ends up being the ruler. But again, I don't know how the Dune books uh, play out. How many Dune books are there? Did we ever? Fr- we, do I feel like we there's discussed like, that. Technically, I think in the main canon, there's like 10 to 12 or so. And then Frank Herbert's son kept Dune going. And so in total, there's like over 30 books in the Dune franchise or the Dune-iverse, uh, uh, Dune-iverse. as it is known. Um, but is it though? Is it, <laughs> yeah, that's actually is the term. People say the dune It's called the Dune-iverse. <laughs> um, but uh, but the, the main thing, and Denis Villeneuve has said this, is that for him... He feels like the main story of Dune is like Dune, the first book, and then the second book, Dune Messiah. He's like, for him, that's the main story, which is why this movie ends with a cliffhanger. I mean, it ends and it is like technically the end of the book Dune. But for Denny, I think Dune, like Dune Part 3 or whatever it's going to be called, if it's not going to be called Part 3, it might be called Dune Messiah is the actual ending of the story. Like, he wants this to be a trilogy. But the whole problem with that is, um, if you go straight to the Dune Messiah, you apparently skip the whole battle. You skip everything. So it's right to... Because I was reading something about that, where they're like, oh, it's Dune Part 1 and 2 for the first book, and then they're going to have Dune Messiah, which is technically the sequel. Mm -hmm. Dune Part 2 was not the sequel. It was just part of. Uh, So Dune Messiah is actually going to be a sequel. So the third movie in the installment is the sequel. I don't like that, but <laughs> also that if you jump right to there, it's already apparently where Paul is in power. So you skip the major battle. So it's kind of like the Sopranos going on where they just cut it and you're left like, could have showed me something. Could have well, given me more. He, he cut some stuff from this book, like to make Boot Dune part two. And he also, apparently a lot of Dune in the book is like people telling you what happened as opposed to you like seeing it it's from like other third party accounts and so he took that and was like well i'm going to show you what happens like we're gonna be in it so who knows maybe in doom part three he's gonna do some different stuff maybe he might show us some more of the holy war and stuff and uh give us more context than the book does like based off of what they say in the book happened i'm not sure so we're like we have no clue what Denise got. I, I I am sure that he has read all of the Dune stuff. Yeah. To know like what to do and how to do it. But he's just like, uh I don't know. I don't know where he's going. But I'm down to see it. I'm down to watch it. Um it more importantly than that, too, I'm really down to definitely like just just like see more of this world the way he's displayed it especially with the religious angle and stuff because like you said earlier like paul is not necessarily the good guy of the story like yes he fights off the big bad who are the parkinans and then he also like takes down the emperor who's this like uh who's become this tyrant basically that he like or at least a person who has no remorse for slaughtering an entire house just because they're not going to follow his rules yeah so uh, and so in that way, like he is the hero, but, uh, it makes me think very much of like, uh, the game, the Metal Gear Solid games, which are like these, uh, tactical espionage games, but there's a line that is very iconic and often is considered the theme of that game series, which is that, uh, today's heroes become tomorrow's villains. Yeah. Like 
you know, it's like in in referencing that, like, in, when it comes to political power, the people who you praise can easily become the people you hate in like the same breath. And so it's just like, you know, we're seeing Paul Atreides go from like being this righteous hero who doesn't want to perpetuate this religious ideal and become this messiah that everybody, that the Bene Gesserit are essentially manipulating an entire culture of people to believe he's going to be. And then he becomes that because for him, he's like, but it'll help me accomplish my goals. And I do want to, I want my revenge. (laughs) That's like, that's like uh, what Alex, um, that's like what Alex mentioned uh, with the, you either uh, die here or live long enough to become the villain. This is referenced a lot. I'm going to bring this to reality TV for a second, but bear with me. Um, with people who go on shows like Big Brother Survivor, their first season, they're loved by the fans. They're a hero. Everybody loves them because they played an honorable game. They may be lost out, but everybody, you know, just appreciated them. Then they come back for another season. And because now there's other people who people are rooting for and maybe they're not on the same side as them they become a villain there's one season in particular that i'm thinking about where it's it's one of like the most hated seasons of big brother ever by the fans it was season 19 this was like 27 2018 2017 and one person from the previous season had come back ironically enough his name was, or excuse me, they, I think they go by they, them now, was Paul. Their name was Paul. <laughs> um, and so Paul uh, came back, was loved by the fans, and they just went on a complete tirade, a complete, like, was controlling the entire house, like, their little puppets, um, was bullying everyone on their way out and every and controlled other people to bully them on their way out and so yeah you really saw the Mm -hmm. evolution or devolution yeah i'm is that that the right word it would still be evolution they're they're changing too yeah of of that character and that character arc so so it, it, it 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 relates it relates I mean, and that's a common story when it comes to anything with political power and having like wars and stuff like that is just uh, it's going to going to show that the main character who you want to root for, you know, is just as bad as the opposing party. Like with a lot of like medieval stories, Games of Thrones, stuff like that, when they were trying to have um, Khaleesi's character. I don't know why I called her Daenerys. Oh, uh, I think they yeah, her. Uh, Daenerys. Yeah. yeah, Daenerys, you know, do all that stuff. She eventually ended up being the villain in the end by, you know, destroying the whole of Westeros. Which so, is, which I, I feel don't like think that's where, I, I feel I don't like think that's where George is going, but who knows? <laughs> I think it was reasonable after they killed her friend. They started <laughs> yeah, it. But yeah, it's seen that throughout media and even, so it's a, it's a common tale. And I think when they were trying to, and Paul fed into it, especially when they kept mentioning the prophecy to him. He's like, well, I do fit the description. And it's like, well, the prophecy, you know, kind of is is morphing to you, not really you're morphing to the prophecy or you guys are going side by side. Things you guys are getting kind of smushed together to make to so that people will follow you and you bleed. So it's like, is the prophecy even real or is that just, you know, are, are any prophecies really real? Or are you just stories to help one person go into power? And that's the best thing about this movie is that because it's like there's a leg to stand on on both sides because it's not like anything Paul says doesn't come true after he drinks the water of life. Like he dies when he drinks the water of life. Chani does come and revive him. But the question becomes, is it did he did she revive him or um, did he just pretend to be dead and then wake up when she came? Oh, or well, like, you know didn't, they say she, didn't they say he was still alive before she even went over there or not that he's dead dead dead, sorry but that rather he'll be in like a coma basically (laughs) until like she wakes him up um was he silenced or was he silenced (laughs) (laughs) and and then it's like you also have like um the moment with like um everything his sister uh says comes true like all of these like so it's like there's this prophecy that's been instilled by this institution of like essentially space witches um, (laughs) that like have that. And, and so it's like, on one hand, it's like, you know, it's a lie. It's a fake 
like fake destiny set up by these people. But at the same time, nothing that has been said hasn't also happened. This reminds so me crazy. so much of that. Uh, what's that terrible show from Marvel with uh, the people who lived on the moon? Oh, uh, the Inhumans. The Inhumans. That show bombed so bad. But it's kind of almost like that, where they had the prophecy and everything. And they tried to make the bad guy look bad. But all that character was saying was like, hey, you shouldn't be forced to work in the mines because you have no powers and everything like that. You should have equal rights. And then he kicks off the old regime from the moon. And it's like, well, is he really the bad guy? As he was just trying to say equal rights. And then the other ones are threatening to come back to the moon and just, you know, murder him and slaughter him. And it's like, but also you can see the points of the, like the old, the old rulers where they're like, yeah, we're trying to keep a balance. We're trying to protect these people who technically are not human either by keeping them on the moon and not letting them go back to earth. Because even though you don't have powers, you're not human. You don't really belong down there. You don't know how that works on there. So it's uh, equal to both sides where one is supposed to be called the villain, but like you got some points. (laughs) Yeah, that show is and, awful. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just like I, I think Dune is in like I I I love a sci-fi, like high, high grade sci-fi or a high concept sci-fi like this, where it's like there's a lot of questions. Nothing is very black and white. And there's a lot of like di- interesting except things. Except for that like, one scene. Yeah, except <laughs> for that one scene. And there's like Literally. enough there's enough black and white for good the one, general audience one. to enjoy it. You know, we still get the battles, we still get like our big bad in the Harkonnen and stuff like that. But there is a lot of undertones that if you're look, willing to dig a little deeper when you're analyzing the movie and think about it a lot more, you could be like, man, there's a lot going on, though. That's very interesting, especially with Chani's character being the skeptic, because apparently in the book, she doesn't really do much of anything except be with Paul and have Paul's babies. Uh, but <laughs> like, and that's pretty much it, But um, according to the book readers. But... Here, they give her a lot more to do in being not only like a freedom fighter, but also the person who's like, I don't believe in prophecies and and religious tales. All right. I believe in what I can see. And what I can see is that there's clearly this uh, religious order trying to enslave my people by basically making them believe that there is some messiah who will come and save them from all of this while abusing the power to uh to make the end that's what happens we paul takes these people from the, their home planet to go fight in a war that really has nothing to do with them yeah he just needs the numbers right at least he and doesn't so personally kill them off he goes full slate uh not slave lincoln i was about to say <laughs> no abe lincoln <laughs> Slave, slave Lincoln. Wow. Slave Lincoln. On, no, uh, Abe Lincoln uh, on him and just be like, yeah, listen, I'll free you. But, you, but, you, but I need you to fight for me, though, real quick. Just, you know, come with me to maybe a few battles here and there, and then, and then y'all be free. <laughs> so, yeah, um, man. But Dune, uh, any, like, Jonathan, what are your final thoughts for Dune Part 2 and, and Grade? Because uh, well, we've been doing this for me. a minute now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have. <laughs> my bad it's been a long week this this monday it's been a long week this monday <laughs> yeah put that on a shirt uh i i did i i, I did enjoy dune part two uh it's good you know dissecting it with you guys um i appreciated the performances i thought um I was really glad that Zendaya she got more than five minutes, which I, I was I was proud of her for that, and I thought she she did a really good job with uh, this role and kind of fleshing out the character, um, getting to learn more of uh, what Shawnee was thinking and get, getting to learn her like how tough of a warrior she is, and um, yeah, just uh, put Shawnee Sand on my on my t shirt right now. Um, <laughs> but also, also, uh, you know, we didn't talk about Javier Bardem really, but I thought his character brought a little levity to the, uh, to the movie as well. And some of his lines yeah. were more of like the, the humorous ones in, in a sea of, or in a dune of all of this, you know, seriousness. Um, uh, I appreciate it. I, I think the movie captured some of the themes. Uh, I haven't read the books, but I, I think it captured some of the themes of the books accurately um from what i have heard and what i've been told 
just um and it, and it like it i felt like it accurately portrayed um this society and how you know like kind of desperate they are to be led um but also wanting their own like individuality at the same time so it kind of like that dichotomy was really interesting um yeah overall I, I really enjoyed it so i i'll give it i know i mentioned we talked about a couple of the cons i talked about co- a couple of my cons but like maybe the chemistry wasn't as good as i initially thought and um some of the character choices with paul um so i'm going to give it an a minus i'm going to give it an a minus visually I couldn't have asked for anything better. It was so cool to watch visually, especially on the big screen. Um, those worms, they killed it. Uh, yeah, I, it does. It didn't look like anything was was created on a green screen, even though a lot of it probably was. But yeah, it it, it just looked really cool. Jerome, what did you think? And what is your rating? Uh, I think this movie is beautiful. I love this film. Um, I'm I'm glad to have directors like Denis Villeneuve around. Uh, this man is just like he understands sci-fi in a way I feel like a lot of modern directors don't. You know, it reminds me of like in my head I'm like this must be what it felt like to like live in live in a time where like Steven Spielberg was in his prime and putting out stuff like E. T. and uh, and uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah, and Jaws and stuff like that. Like, and and then like you know, like when Ridley Scott was in his prime, putting out stuff like Alien, like just these like uh, having a, a director that takes sci-fi seriously and is willing to go places that a lot of sci-fi directors aren't, especially when it comes to like this movie. I mean, it is on a blockbuster level, but it's smarter than that. Like, it's not just spectacle for the sake of spectacle. Like it is, there's a, there's so much going on with like the, the characters and the history and um, the the relationships and things like that. And that you know, and mind you, a lot of it is because it's based off of a source material that took the time to flesh these things out for him. So it's not like you know, it's an original sci-fi. This is an adaptation, but still, like the way that the movie is directed and captures all of that is still strong. You know what I mean? And so it's like. I, I'm glad movies like, and it's just like, you look at what this man's doing. He did Arrival. He did Blade Runner 2049. He's done Dune Part 1 and 2. Like, he's making the sci-fi movies I want to be watching. And so, I all that to say, like, this movie's immaculate. I love it. I love all the performances. I think this is an upgrade compared to Dune Part 1 for me personally. I'm excited for the third one. I mean, <laughs> especially to see Anya Taylor-Joy get thrown into this, because we didn't talk about her much, her, her lone little brief cameo. Well, they didn't talk movie. about her much either. Yeah, well, because they, they wanted it to be a surprise that she was in this movie at all, because uh, she's uncredited. But then they spoiled it because she was at the red carpet and everything. And... That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, I'm excited to see more of this world uh, through uh, the lens that Denise working through it. Um, but also just like sp- speaking to this movie specifically, I love just the, the, the character moments. And while I don't think the chemistry between Zendaya and Timothy is really strong, I still love their scenes with them together. Um, just because they're such good performers. Uh, I wish the villains were a little stronger, but you know, I feel like Austin Butler fills a lot of the void for a lot of it. Um, when he finally arrives, just that he doesn't come till halfway through the movie. I, in fact, as I was watching the movie, I was like, where the hell is Austin Butler at? <laughs> like, they made a big deal about him being in this movie and it's been a goddamn hour and he ain't showing up yet. <laughs> so, well, like, movie's like three hours something. So he had plenty yeah, of time true. to come in. <laughs> but um, like uh, overall, I think this movie is great. I think you should watch it on the big screen if you can, on the biggest screen if possible. So if you can, if that means watching it in IMAX, if you can't do IMAX, at the very least do Dolby Cinema, and uh, you know get that sound quality, um, and you know hear that soundtrack. For me, I probably will give this movie just a solid A. Um, I think it just it just is just shy of that A plus mark for me because of those minor things. But overall, I really love this movie um it's probably going on my list of like my uh my uh, uh expectations list 2025 of uh, things that met or surpassed my expectations for sure alex what do you think 
I'm thinking I need to get my eyebrows done. Sorry. <laughs> my focus was for a second. Um, for all the jokes I make about this movie, I think it actually really was well made. It, it was visually appealing. I do like the worms. I, again, I say the buckets did them dirty because they were actually pretty cool looking when they came out of the sand the first time. And it was, you know, not terrifying, but it was like, oh, yeah, if I saw that thing coming at me. I would definitely be like, okay, I need to make peace with my end. So <laughs> I I think the way they use the desert, I'm not sure where what desert they filmed in, but when they were it actually... Says, uh, I'm not sure what desert, but I, I had looked it up and it said they filmed in... Um, they filmed in Budapest, Italy, Jordan, and Abu Dhabi. So I don't know what desert, whatever desert they used over there it was, you know, it was beautiful to see. You can definitely tell definitely when they were outside and when the sand was real and it was a beautiful reflection uh, with the sun, the way the sun hit the ground. So I think everybody played their parts really well. Everybody seemed to immerse themselves into the character they wanted to present. Mm-hmm. Happy Zendaya got more time in this time than in Dune Part 1, even though I didn't really see what happened in Dune Part 1. <laughs> but I, I, like I said, I don't think you really need to see Part 1 to understand the story or what they're trying to get you to understand in Dune Part 2. And I think it really does have to go back to the author and the book and the uh, source material for there. It is a well-written book book and i i would actually love to read it from what i've just watched on screen apparently since there's missing parts i didn't know about the three-year-old killing the the old guy that seems weird <laughs> there's that's a, a chucky size doll going on as maybe, I said. We'll, maybe we'll have to talk about later of why it's very important that this three-year-old is the one to kill him uh uh that i i don't feel comfortable saying uh on the recording but i'll, I'll yeah let's, to let's later. wait that but um <laughs> But like I'll give this movie a solid B. I think it is pretty good. Uh, the the effects are well done. It was just not my type of sci-fi. You know, it just hinders on the other the other side where I'm more I guess space techie and space space than like staying hanging out on a planet. Which nothing wrong with that when it comes to sci-fi, especially when it's done visually so well. And I think to be shall. Timothy Chalamet's portrayal of Paul, I do like that there is a bit of brattiness to it too. Like when he does that shouting, it doesn't always feel oh, yeah. like he's when going he from voice. like, oh uh, yeah, where it kind of feels like, oh, you're being a brat now because everybody's telling you, you know, you're a prophet. You can see it's like there's still this childness in him that's like, well, I'm going to yell now because I'm frustrated. Instead of saying my actual feelings, I'm just going to yell at you. So I think he he's able to to portray that really well without it looking ridiculous or childish. But there's still this brattiness every time he does raise his voice in a way where it's like, or when yeah, he flexes his power too when he tells her to it's like silence. He's like, shut your ass up, old woman. I'm yeah, talking. it's like it's like okay, you yeah, you were definitely the child of a duke or something royal where you think you're talking to everybody like that and it's okay. No, so. <laughs> But yeah, a solid a solid B for this movie. I definitely would give it. Nice. Audience, what do you think? Let us know. All right. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Dune, what you thought of the characters, everything. Did you read the books? How does it compare to the movie? All of that good stuff. You can follow us. At, actually, no. Okay. Jerome, socials. <laughs> socials. You can follow me at not Jerome Rhett on Instagram. And then also follow us in total uh, at the first ones to die. Um, and especially on the YouTube channel, go to the YouTube channel. You can get all types of content that you cannot get on the audio streaming platforms. And we're going to, this year, we're going to be putting out some extra content. All right. Monster Camp Part 2 is coming out soon. We got more mini reviews coming out soon. We got some more stuff that we want to do that I'm not even going to tell you about because it's got to be a surprise. So if you want to, you know, you don't want to miss out. There's only one place to go as that's the, to the first ones to die YouTube channel. Subscribe. Hit the notification bell, like, favorite, do all the things you've heard the spiel from other YouTubers, I'm sure. So, you know, do all like do all those things because I'm telling you, you're not going to want to miss this extra podcast goodness. Um, but if you are listening on the audio streaming platform, give us a review, five stars, and also email us at thefirstwithdie at gmail.com, you know what I mean? And then, uh, or just comment below on our videos and tell us what you're thinking. Uh, Alex, where can people find you? You <laughs> don't know why you said it like that. You can find me at Alex and Nobody on Instagram and on TikTok, although the TikTok's mainly of just cheddar being adorable. 
You can also find me on the podcast tech talk. The first ones that I were post little clips of episodes we have done episodes we are thinking of doing and things I do when I'm bored. I treat that partially as my own personal social media because the other <laughs> one's filled with my cat. So when I want to complain about a movie, I go to our podcast. I was like, hey, it's a media one. You can find me over there. What about you, Jonathan? Where are we finding you? You can follow me at Jonathan Keys on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you please. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please go ahead and give us a like and subscribe. We would greatly appreciate that. Now, yep. next week. Tune in next week for Trivia, Trivia 9. Trivia. The game is on. <laughs> is that oh, your that's tagline? The that's the official. Yes. That's the, you know what? Yes. We'll take it. The, the official subtitle for Trivia the 9. Game is the on. game is on. <laughs> It's not going to be T9. Our last, ch- last champion is an out of town champion. It was Jasmine. <laughs> it is. Which we still have to play that game. That's true. We do. We, we got uh, to If you want to know what game that is, tune on into Trivia 8 so you can find out more. It was a very crazy time. We had special guests and everything. So, mm. you know, tri- but Trivia 9's coming, man. It's going to be a great time. Who knows who's going to be there? Because it might just be us three, but it could be some special people, some other special guests. You don't know who's Hold coming on. to the trivia games because they get wild, they get crazy. Uh, just show gets, Gibson. Gets Sorry, I can see you messing with him. Show, get, I want to see Gibson. I know. Yes, tune in for like trivia guest. night. I could see, I could see him like. I, I I was listening to you, Jerome, but I kept looking at. I'm so distracted because I'm like Gibson's right there. <laughs> Show me the dog. Show me the dog. Speaking of special hey. guests, like, I love how stiff he gets when you pick him up because he's just like, <laughs> yeah, don't pick me up. But, like, <laughs> ah, look at that face. I like how his ears are black too. <laughs> Look at that audience. Mug. There you go. Uh, tune in next week. But until then, have a good night, good morning, good evening, whenever you're listening to this. And we will see you next time. Bye. 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 Lose <laughs> face so much. I see you. I know you know I'm here. <laughs> Go on over to the YouTube channel at the first ones to die to see all the fun stuff we got going on here. Like mini reviews, book reviews, gaming videos, vlogs, all types of stuff. Please follow us at First Ones to Die everywhere. Go ahead and give us a like and subscribe.